Everybody, we're ready. Seven, six, five, four, three, two. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the Plymouth United Church of Christ, located in the heart of Detroit, the very tip top of the medical center area of Detroit, 600 East Warren Avenue. And I am thrilled that you are worshiping with us today. My sermon today is entitled, One Night in Miami, Lessons from One Night in Miami, uh, and the Power of Positive Attitude. Uh, the text is taken from the book of Philippians. It's absolutely one of my favorite texts in the whole Bible. And it says uh, in verse uh, 8, finally brothers, we might say, and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Last week, I went over to my brother Steve's house. Steve is my only brother alive right now. I don't know how many of you have a brother or sister who's alive. Uh, but if you have a sibling, a brother or a sister, one of the most important things you can do is just keep in contact. So I went over to Steve's house. I called him up in advance. I said, Steve, I've got a couple hours. Uh, do you have a movie we can see? And he said, let me think about it. And so I get in the car. I drive over to Steve's house. And when I come in, I said, OK, what are we looking at? And he says, you know, Nick, normally when you come over here, we look at a shoot -em up. And well, I don't know about you, but Steve can find shoot ups I've never heard about. And <laughs> futuristic shoot em ups, uh, cowboy western shoot em ups, modern day shoot em ups. And so I was just prepared for a shoot em up. But when I get over there, Steve says, I have something cerebral tonight. And I said, Oh, what does that mean? He says, have you heard of a movie called One Night in Miami? It's by Regina King. Yeah. I said, yes, I've heard about it. And he said, let's look at that, if you don't mind. So I said, OK, sounds good. And as soon as the movie went on, came on, uh, it's about Jim Brown, Sam Cooke, Muhammad Ali, and Malcolm X. Uh, and it, it centers around a real life event. Uh, the four men got together. In the movie, it's portrayed as immediately after uh, Sonny Liston stays in his corner and Ali wins that celebrated fight down there in Miami. Uh, I don't know if that's when it happened, uh, before it happened, or after it happened, or the night that it happened. But the one thing that we do know is it did happen. And you know, Sam Cooke, uh, Muhammad Ali were the same age. They were, uh, they got together when Sam Cooke, I think was 32 years of age. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it's worth looking at another documentary called uh, The Second Killing of Sam Cooke. Uh, and one of the, the main parts in that movie is that Sam Cooke seeks out Muhammad Ali. Why? Not because he was a prize fighting uh, aficionado, but Sam Cooke realized early on that Ali was the best in his field. And, and not only was he the best, he was a character. And so Sam Cooke, according to this documentary about his life, sends his publicist to the door of Muhammad Ali's home, where his uh, brother answers the door and slams the door in his face. And then the mother asks, who is it? Who's there? And he says, I'm representing Sam Cooke. And the mother shouts to the, the, her other son, Muhammad Ali's brother. She said, open that door. And she said, don't you know who that is? And Sam Cooke, through his white agent, uh, sets up a meeting with Muhammad Ali. This is before One Night in Miami. Uh, but they get together, and uh, Walt, you would like this because Muhammad Ali and Sam Cooke. Now, Sam Cooke is a great singer, 
But they have a documentary of this where Sam Cooke and Ali, they're just young men. You know, they're older than Marcus. Yep. But they're young men. They're in their early thirties. They have a microphone in front of them, a tape recorder. Somebody is filming them and they've got their heads together singing some clownish song. It's hilarious uh, to see these young brothers just having such a wonderful time. But in the movie, uh, One Night in Miami, you have Jim Brown, who was at the top of his game with the Cleveland Browns. Uh, he was in his early 30s, and I think he retired at 32 from the Cleveland Browns with uh, NFL rushing records that stand to this day. He's in the top five rushers in the entire NFL. Barry Sanders uh, from the Detroit Lions is in that group. Uh, but Jim Brown is still one of the leaders of the rushing records. You had Sam Cooke, who is a tremendous singer, but at the time of his death, Sam Cooke was more than a singer. Sam Cooke uh, was a black publisher of music. He was putting together a black recording company, not just of any Tom, Dick, and Harry, but he was talking to people like James Brown. He was talking to uh, Jackie Wilson. He was talking to the top singers of his day. And some people think that Sam Cooke was killed because he frightened the music industry. They had never, and even to this day, have never, even bigger than what Barry Gordy was putting together and put together with Motown, that Sam Cooke uh, was on a whole nother level. He was also talking to some white artists and it scared the living daylights out of the music industry. Then you had Muhammad Ali, uh, who arguably to this day is the greatest prize fighter ever. Now, you know, I've heard people like Joe Lewis and I've heard uh, others say, oh, in our day we could take Muhammad Ali. Uh, I tell you what, but Muhammad Ali has, a, has records that still stand to this day. He's only knocked down four times. You think about that. In the world of professional fighting, he was only knocked down four times. Uh, I forget his record of wins, but it's astounding. Uh, and it, believe me, everybody who fought Muhammad Ali, they wanted to beat Muhammad Ali. And they tried to beat Muhammad Ali, but they, most of them could not beat him. And then you have Malcolm X in the movie, who, uh, according to the movie, the night that he recruits Muhammad Ali to become a Muslim, uh, the next day that Malcolm X leaves the nation of Islam. Uh, and so this is a real life event that happened in Miami, and it happened at a place called the Hampton House Motel. The Hampton House Motel in Miami is a real life place. Uh, I visited the Hampton House in 2015. Uh, I was on a book tour with my first book, The Test of Strength, the Endurance, and the Way Out. And I drove, uh, I didn't sleep in my car, but I drove from Detroit to Atlanta. Uh, I went from Atlanta to Daytona Beach, and from Daytona Beach, I went down to Miami. And in each of those cities, Atlanta, Miami, and Daytona Beach, you know, we have a network of churches. And I stopped at United Church of Christ churches. The pastors opened the doors. Uh, they let me preach. They let me show, you know, my books and sell the books. And they gave me an honorarium. Now, where did I learn that from? Jeremiah Wright. Jeremiah Wright told me, he said, self-publish and take your books on the road with you. Go to your friend base. Go to your preacher friends just like me. And I said, that's what I'll do. Uh, but in Miami, you know, I was there for a couple of nights. And while I was there, Enid Pinckney, who was an elderly woman at our church, it's called the Church of the Open Door in Miami. Enid told me, she said, Nick, you know, uh, do you want to see something I'm involved with? I said, sure. She said, I am the head of a nonprofit corporation in Miami that has as its mission refurbishing the Hampton House. I said, what's the Hampton House? She said, well, this was a historic black hotel. 
uh, back in the day. She said it was actually owned by uh, white financiers, I think from New Jersey or New York. And she said uh, the Hampton House was one of the few places where the black entertainers and just the black population could stay. And uh, she said, my group is trying to restore it. I said, great. So she takes me to the Hampton House, and I look at that smaller than an Olympic-sized pool, and then it dawned on me. I knew right away when I saw what I was looking at. I said, Enid, is this the pool where Muhammad Ali took the picture underwater? She said, uh, I don't know. I said, I think it is. It's got to be the place. And sure enough, uh, you know, the movie by Regina King validated that. Uh, but it gave me goosebumps. I'm having goosebumps right now thinking about that. I said, I am in the place where Muhammad Ali got in the water. He didn't even know how to swim. Uh, but he gets in the water with his trunks on. And a photographer gets in the water with him with an underwater casing on his camera. And they take a series of pictures. And it gave me goosebumps. Every major and not so major city in America had a hotel like the Hampton House. In Detroit, the top of the line black hotel was a place right down the street from where I am right now. On John R. and Mack, it was called the Gotham. The Gotham Hotel. And as a little boy, on Sundays, if we didn't go to the, the uh, what's the, the one, Howard Johnson up in uh, Highland Park, with the 22 flavors or 32 flavors or however many flavors of ice cream they had. My family would sometimes, I guess if my dad got a big offering that day, he would take us to the Gotham. And at the Gotham, now you gotta remember, I was just a little boy. And so from a little boy's perspective, at this famous black hotel on John R. just north of Mac, they had white linen tablecloths, and they had hot uh, homemade rolls. Now, I don't remember a thing. I, they, somebody told me they had great fried chicken and everything else. I don't remember the fried chicken. All I remember is the tablecloth and those hot buttered rolls. And back in the day, and you know, it's a funny thing about Detroit history. There at John R., north of Mac, you had the Gotham Hotel. If you went one block to the west, guess what was there? Orchestra Hall. But when the black people, uh, when the white people ran away from Orchestra Hall, we call it now the Max Fisher, they ran away from it. But when they ran away from it, guess what kept Orchestra Hall open? The Paradise uh, Valley. It was the black musicians. Uh, it was people like Nat King Cole, uh, people like Louis Armstrong. Uh, they were all there. Count Basie. Uh, those are the people that kept uh, Paradise Hall open. And, and the funny thing is, they could perform over there on Woodward, just north of uh, Mac, and then they go to bed on John R., one block away at Mac. Uh, but that's part of the history of Detroit. A lot of people don't like to talk about it, but it's real. And as I think about the movie, each of the four men featured in this movie represents the power, in my mind, of positive attitude, uh, optimism, and uh, individual success. Think about it again. Jim Brown was and still is a rushing record holder for the NFL, rushing yards. Muhammad Ali uh, was viewed, he's dead now, but is viewed by many as the best boxer of all time. Sam Cooke had a voice that was unparalleled, but he was on the cusp of putting together a black music production company. Malcolm X was a dynamic spiritual leader in the nation of Islam and a spokesman for civil rights who established his own version of an Islamic sect separate from the nation of Israel, Islam. Each of these men represented in their lifetime and in their youth the very best of their fields. Each of these men was optimistic about their individual success. And there's a lesson 
from their real life story, and if you don't know the real life story, go to the movie, One Night in Miami. And the lesson is, if you want to be a success, you have to believe in yourself. You have to work at being a success. But you also have to believe in yourself. And what I see in Sam Cooke, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, and Malcolm X is people who believed in themselves. As I penned this sermon, I wanted to talk about positive attitude and success. And I wanted a verse from the Bible that talks about positive attitude and success. But it dawned on me last night that I chose the wrong verse. I chose the wrong verse for this sermon. Uh, and I misnamed uh, the verse for positive attitude and success. The text that I have for today is not about positive attitude. It's not even about success. But what this verse really speaks to is principle and character. Some people are optimistic and others are principled. Some have character and others are just a straight out and out character. I, I had another brother many years ago who died about 20 years ago named Emery. And Emery was a character. Emery was just a stone out character. Emery played in a band with me. I never will forget at the Veterans Memorial Building, yes, my band played there the night of the infamous Veterans Memorial incident where black boys got beat up, including Derek Tabor. Derek may be looking at this right now. Uh, but the night that Derek got beat up, we were playing in the big ballroom there. Everybody, there's seven guys in the band. Everybody in the band is facing the audience, except guess who? Emory. We're all looking this way, and Emory, with his bass, is turned around this, that way. <laughs> he, there was a big window at the back of the stage, and Emory is looking out the window while we're playing, you know, and he was a character. And so even to this day, I meet women uh, who tell me, they say, yeah, I used to like your band, and I said, did you... Who'd you like in the band? And they start grinning. They say, Emery. You know, and all I could think of was Emery was a character. You know, he's the guy who's going to play with his back to you. Uh, but so Emery represents the opposite of what I'm talking about here. Uh, some people are principled and have character. Others are just a straight out and out character. But listen to what the Bible verse tells us about principle. Because Principle is also important. I'm not sure how principled Muhammad Ali and Sam Cooke and Jim Brown were, and Jim Brown is now. I'm not sure how principled they really were. But they were committed to success. Uh, I'm not sure about Malcolm X and his principles. I don't know enough about his principles. But listen to what the Apostle Paul says in the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians about principle and character. Eighth verse, he says, finally, brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I want you to think for just a moment about each of these elements of a principled life. Number one. To be true, to be true to what you believe, to be true to yourself. This is a spectacular principle for a principled life. To be honorable, to have a sense of, uh, you know, honor, a sense of dignity, a sense of character in your life. Uh, how many people do you know carry their life with a sense of honor? I've been looking at Senator Lindsey Graham this week with the news media chronicle, chronicling every time he's flip-flopped on an issue. That is not an example of honor, my friends. That's an example of political survivability. Uh, Paul says a principled life should be a just life. What's a just life? A just life is a fair life. Paul says a principled life should be a pure life. 
What's a pure life? It is a life that is undefiled. It is a life that is not spoiled. It is a life that neither wavers to the left or to the right, but it is a, a life that knows what really matters. Uh, Paul says the principled life should be a lovely life, uh, not a disgusting life, not a dirty, low-down, and nasty life, but a lovely life. And then Paul says the good life should be a commendable life. In other words, something that you might offer to somebody else and say, this is the kind of life you ought to be living. And then finally, Paul says, your life should be a life of excellence. Now, Muhammad Ali, Sam Cooke, Jim Brown, Malcolm X, they all strove for a life of excellence. And so think for a matter, for a moment, what does it take to be a person of principle and good character? And to me, the reality is that every life is presented with challenges. The challenges of life can seem overwhelming. If you wake up this morning and you have cancer, that is a challenge. If you woke up this morning and you don't know how you're going to pay your bills because of this pandemic, that, my friend, is a challenge. If you woke up this morning and the love of your life looked you in the face and said, I'm kicking your sorry self to the curb because you can't do a thing for me anymore. Uh, that is a life with a challenge. Uh, and the challenges of life can seem overwhelming. Uh, but the challenge of the moment, whatever your moment is, whether or not you can pay your bills, whether or not you're sick unto death, uh, whether or not you've lost love, that, that is a challenge of the moment. It faces you and, and me with a, a basic choice. Am I going to approach my challenge with optimism or will I face my challenge with negativity? If I face it with negativity, then I look at it and I say, woe is me, I cannot survive this challenge. If I face my challenge with optimism, I look at the challenge, I say, yes, I may be without money, Yes, I may be without honey. Yes, I may be sick under death, but I do believe I can make it anyhow. That is a life of optimism. Uh, am I going to be principled or unprincipled? Am I going to be optimistic or am I, will I be negative? Will I be fair or unfair? Uh, and one of the things that the nation is experiencing right now uh, and has experienced over the last four years is a sense of negativity, a sense of hate, and most of all, fear. Uh, and, and the reason why I say most of all fear is the angry white men, the angry white women who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, more than anything else, they may present a, a sense of bravado and all of this misguided patriotism. But at the core, if you challenge them, they're fearful. And what are they fearful of? Number one, they're fearful that their white entitlement uh, is being taken away from them. They're fearful that black people and brown people are going to take their jobs. They're fearful uh, that uh, the world as they have known it is going away. Uh, and Donald Trump, uh, to his negative credit, uh, stoked those fears. He stoked those fears. And, you know, there's some people who uh, uh, fear and feel that capitalism by itself will produce inequality. I don't share that fear. Uh, but I'm trying to go back through the ranks uh, because I'm convinced that it is fear that is guiding all the unrest in America right now. Fear uh, on, on the, the conservative end, they call themselves conservative, I don't think they're really conservative. Uh, I think they're just misguided people. Uh, but there's fear on one end that says we're gonna lose our white entitlement. On the other end, there's a fear on the progressive end that if we don't do something dramatic, then the poor will be left out. Uh, and so you take these two groups of fear, 
uh, and they are colliding with one another. Uh, but I don't want to believe that is the case. Currently, uh, you may have heard me say a couple weeks ago, my youngest son got me into listening to audible books. I started with Frederick Douglass. I went on to Isabel, uh, what's her name's book, about caste and how caste is the new color. Uh, well, it's not the new color. It's the existing color barrier in America that the caste system in America is defined by how dark you are. And, uh, and both from white people looking at it, black people, and then black people looking at it, black people. Who's the lightest? Who's the darkest? And people, Isabel Wilkerson is her name. And then from there, I went on to listen, read uh, W.B. Du Bois' book uh, on the soul of black folk. And it's funny. Uh, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, I read those books when I was in my 20s, but it didn't sink in. But now I'm switching gears after looking at what happened in the Capitol on January 6th. I said, Nick, you need another kind of reading. And so I'm going back to another book that I read when I was 20 years of age, The Wealth of the Nations by Adam Smith. Uh, I study economics in, in college. You had, that's one of the first books they make you read in economics in college. Uh, and I said, let me go back to Adam Smith. I said, maybe I missed something along the way. And because what I'm trying to learn uh, and figure out is, is there an economy in America uh, that would fit the masses? Is there an economic model we could come up with that makes sense? And I, frankly, I think that President Biden is on the wrong track. Now, I voted for him, but I think he's on the wrong track. And I'm going to tell you why I think he's on the wrong track. He, he's well-intentioned to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, you know, that will placate some people, but that is not the sole answer to give a stimulus check, whether or not it's $1,600 or $2,000 uh, to the, the working poor and the unemployed, it's well-intentioned, but it's not enough. Our president, Biden, talks about unifying the nation. But if he's really going to unify the nation, you know what I would suggest he do? I would suggest that he call up the head of the Proud Boys, I would suggest that he call up the head of, is it called QAnon? And there are all these groups that, that were part of the insurrection on January 6th. I would call them together. I don't think I'd bring them to the White House. I might bring them to <laughs> the Capitol Mall in front of the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> but I'd bring them there. I'd set some chairs and some lemonade. And I say, okay, break it down to me. What is it that really has you so doggone upset with America? And let's see if we can't find common ground. And I think if, and, and you know, that's the last thing you're going to hear. Uh, but when you, he gets to the point of calling together all those groups that stormed the Capitol and to talk to them in real life terms and in a non judgmental way. That is the point where you will have healing in the land. And if he doesn't do it, no matter how many $1,600 checks and $15 an hour laws are passed, it will not be enough. And so I encourage you to live a life, your life, with a sense of optimism. Uh, not just with optimism, but with a perspective that is positive. Uh, I also encourage you uh, to think about the examples of Jim Brown, Sam Cooke, Muhammad Ali, and Malcolm X that are in that movie, One Night in Miami. And each of these men represent, to me, examples of outstanding success, examples of optimism, examples of personal drive and ambition. And I want you to think about your own life and ask yourself, what do I want to accomplish this day. What do I want to achieve? 
What are the new mountains you want to climb? What new rivers do you want to swim? I am at a stage of life where my well-to-do friends and church members uh, are looking at life and saying, I am ready to settle down. Uh, but I don't want to settle down. I feel like the Lord has given me, if I'm lucky, 21 more years of life. You think about that. And I ask myself every day, what will I do this day? I don't want to go to sleep at night because I'm too doggone excited about the day. I'm not interested in stopping. I'm not interested in sitting. I'm not interested in sitting under a shade tree sipping Starbucks. Uh, I'm not interested uh, in tending a garden. Uh, I like the idea of playing with grandchildren, reflecting and being happy. But what I really get excited about is looking for another mountain to climb. What really excites me is about looking for another river to swim. Uh, and every time I open my computer, Microsoft Office 10 shows me another part of the world I have not been to. They show me Sri Lanka. They show me Indonesia. They show me Vietnam. They show me all these places I'd like to go. And in every screen saver and opening that opens up on my computer, I see another mountain. I see another river. I see another ocean. I see another rock formation. And I look at it and I say, I will not be satisfied living until I've seen another sunset and sunrise. And I say to myself, I want to go there. And so my friends, if you want to live a life that's fresh, exciting and interesting, I suggest you look for another mountain. I put my stock in Jesus Christ. And as long as I can walk, as long as I can think, I'm excited about life. I'm ready to move on and see something new. I'm ready to give my life to the Lord on a level that I've never done before. And I believe in Jesus and always have believed in Jesus from the, ch the, the time I was a child. But right now, I look at Jesus in a different way. And I look at the Lord and I say, Lord, take me. Lord, make me. Lord, shape me. Lord, move me. Lord, give me another challenge. Lord, give me another view. Lord, give me another movie to look at. Give me another river to swim. Lord, I like the stimulation that you give to me in life. And I promise you, if you stay with me till I die, I will never, ever leave you. And so, my friends, this day, I open the doors of the church. I open the doors of the church to those who have not made a commitment to the Lord. I open door, the doors of the church to those who are looking to get their life right. I'm opening the doors of the church to, to the person who's bored, to the person who is just turned off with life. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ offers you life. Jesus will offer you salvation. Jesus will offer you purpose. Jesus will offer you meaning and fulfillment in life. Don't let one minute of your life go by in waste. But rather, I encourage you right now to give your life to the Lord. Won't you come right now? I tell you, there's a blessing in this house. It's waiting for you. Just have faith to receive it. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing. Will you sing with us? The words are real simple. Just sing, there's a blessing in this house. Mm -hmm. It's waiting for you. There's a blessing in this house. And it's waiting for you. It's waiting for you. There's a blessing in this house. What are you praying for? Today? And it's waiting for you. Somebody's praying for help. Just have faith. Another person is praying for more money. Receive it.
somebody just wants to see their granddaughter. God knows but because of the pandemic, that you need it. Tied right up in your own house. There's a blessing. But there's a blessing. In this house. It's waiting for and you. It's waiting for you. There's healing in this house. Waiting for you. There is healing. Do you have cancer? Multiple sclerosis, diabetes, creeping up your feet. To somebody today, waiting for an organ transplant. It's waiting right now. Won't you come? Give your life to the Lord. Just have faith. Just have faith. God knows that you need it. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing. There's a blessing. And it's waiting for you. This house. Now we're coming to my favorite verse. There's love waiting for you. I love you. There is love. I can't tell you. How much I love you. And it's waiting for you. But I actually think about you. I want you. There is love. There's love in this house. It's waiting for you. And it's waiting for you. Just have faith in receiving. God knows that you did. Just invite you now to bow your head, close your eyes, and pray what you are praying for right now. Just ask and it shall be given to you. Seek it, you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. Gracious Master and our God, I pray right now for the person who's lost a sense of optimism. I pray for those who are so desperate, they've thrown their principles and character to the wind. I pray for the coupled people. I pray for the single people. I'm praying right now for the children. I'm praying for the lonely people. I'm praying for those who don't have enough money. And I want you to know God will supply your every need. I pray for this nation and the fresh start we have with a new president. Oh Lord God, when we go to sleep at night and you determine that it's our time to take away this life that we've come to cherish, let me down easy. I don't want to fight when I go to heaven but just let me down easy take away the soul the breath that I've come to depend upon and on that last day redeem me of my sins grant me life everlasting in that kingdom which has no end through Jesus Christ our rock and Redeemer. I pray. Amen. Brother Mike, hold tight. I want you to take this back. Amen. Now friends, uh, this is the mail that came to the church this week. And I'm so thrilled. You know, I don't know what Trump and his allies, here's one more from our moderator, Ella Davis. 
I don't know what uh, the president was talking about, saying that he had no confidence in the U.S. Postal Service. I have a lot of confidence in him. Because <laughs> the Postal Service and the support of the church is keeping the church going. But I got the biggest surprise of my life yesterday. Uh, I got a couple phone calls saying the church has a letter, and it's at the post office, and only you, Reverend Hood, can pick it up. So I went to the post office. I had to wait a long time on the Milwaukee Street post office. There were about 10 people in front of me and only one person at the window. But when I got up there, there was a letter. It was, and in the letter was this check. And the check is from the Bettina Chapman Living Trust. And her relative had called me and told me, he said, uh, Miss Chapman died and she left the church some money. And she said, um, only you can pick it up. And so I went there to the post office, I picked up the check, and it is a check for $23,292.59. Oh, I say, right there, amen. <laughs> and I'm not just bragging about it, but I'm thinking about it from a teaching standpoint. Now, I'm going to be honest. I have some members at this church who give more money than this every year to the church. So this check is a big deal, but it's not the biggest deal. But it is a big deal. Amen. And it's a big deal for another reason. What we don't have is, while I have some members who give this much money a year to the church, what I don't have is anybody in the church on a regular basis who gives this kind of money through a living trust. And so this is the teaching moment. Uh, now, some of you, a lot of you who are looking at this right now, don't go to this church. And you may look at this and say, well, that doesn't relate to me. And I say, you are wrong. It really relates to you. And it relates to you because if you have a history with any church, uh, whatever your church is, uh, I want you to think about it and say, can I create a living trust for my church so I can give my church a shot in the arm during a pandemic, so I can give uh, my church support when it needs it the most? And so I encourage you to think about that. And, and it dawned on me when I picked this up yesterday, I said, you know, Nick, you never talk about it. And that's your problem. Your problem is you don't talk about it. You need to talk about the importance of making a living trust to your church. So as we prepare to worship the Lord with our offerings and gifts, I invite you to run down to your bedroom cubby, pull out your checkbook, and I don't know where you keep your checkbook, uh, but I bet you somebody keeps it in your bedroom cubby uh, under your personal items. Dig under the personal items, pull out, go into your purse, go into your wallet, pull out your check, write a check to your church. If you remember the Plymouth United Church of Christ, write it out. P-L-Y-M-O-U-T-H, United Church of Christ. Put the check in an envelope, mail it to the church so we can show the postal service how much we appreciate them and send it to your church. Will you repeat with me? Judge not, judge not and you will not be judged. And you will not be judged. Condemn, not, Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. And you will not be condemned. Forgive, Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And you will be forgiven. Give, Give. And, it shall be given to you. and it shall be given to you. Good measure, Good measure. pressed down, pressed down. Shaken, together. shaken together, running over. Over. will be put into your lap will be put into your for, the measure you give for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Will be the measure you get back. Let us worship now the Lord with our offerings and gifts. Remember that God loves a cheerful giver and to those whom much is given, much more is required. Amen. 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 I'd like to call now upon Dr. Ella Davis, uh, our immediate past uh, moderator of the church, to lead us in the uh, United Church of Christ Statement of Faith. And let me just say this. I want you to listen very carefully 
to what the, Dr. Davis is saying. And I want you, if you don't have a church home, I want you to think about joining the church. And when you think about joining the church, you know, it won't be long before we can open the church back up. People are lining up right now to get the vaccination from the virus. And what that means is that in a few months, we'll be able to open back up again. But listen very carefully to, to what Dr. Davis is saying and ask yourself, can I be comfortable in a church like this? God bless and God keep you. Thank you, Reverend Hood. <clears throat> Good morning. <clears throat> and I in invite you, if you're able to, uh, to join along with me in the reading of the United Church of Christ Statement of Faith. We believe in God, the eternal spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the world into being, creates man in his own image, and sets before him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges men and nations by his righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his service in the service of men, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen. Praise God from Sings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Oh! 
Let's sing that again, same key. Come on. Lord, I just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Jerome, give us a little bit there. Worship and 
again, I thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, we're wrapping up our worship. This is a difficult time, uh, but I thank you for sticking with the church. On uh, Friday, I got a text message from my son in California. He said, Jonah, your grandson, is taking his first steps. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it, and I said, how awful. Uh, that uh, this little boy is taking his steps, and I can't see it. Uh, but it is a good thing in the sight of the Lord. And this pandemic will be over sooner rather than later, and I encourage you to stick with the church. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Emmanuel